So welcome, welcome everyone to the CDY initiative talk. As we know, these are the series of seminars that uh, Columbia DS and Yale have been hosting. Today's talk is by Dr. Jim Hinton. And uh, this is, uh, uh, the, the, the title of today's talk is, uh, is Pevatron's Detection Techniques and Observations. And this is the first of a set of two talks that we're doing on Pevatron's the second one by Stefano Gabici will be on March 23rd. And the title of that one is Theory and Technology of Pevatrons. And that's two weeks from now on, on the 23rd of March. Uh, but welcome to today's talk by Jim. Uh, Jim is currently the director at MPIK, the Max Planck Institute of Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, a role that he has held in the, since 2015. Uh, Jim received his PhD from the University of Leeds and he has held the position of chair at the University of Leicester before coming to Heidelberg. Jim has many years of experience in gamma ray and cosmic ray experiments. Uh, he's worked on a series of experiments on cosmic rays. And uh, while he was a postdoc and a research fellow, he was based in the UK as well as in the US. And one of the experiments that uh, he worked on, Stacy, the so solar tower atmospheric Cherkov experiment, this was uh, one of the experiments that we collaborated on together. Uh, Jim was the project scientist of CTA since 2019 and is currently the spokesperson of SWGO, the Southern Whitefield Gamma Ray Observatory. Uh, Jim's work has been recognized by several awards, including the Shakti Dugal Award, the Levin Prize, and the Wolfson Award. His scientific interests are very broad and they cover many topics in multi messenger astronomy, astroparticle physics, uh, galactic sources, gamma ray binaries. Evertrons and many other topics. So let's welcome Jim and thank you very much for giving us this talk. Um, we, we, it's up to you to ask questions during the talk. I think what we've been doing is, is about 50 minutes of talk followed by 15 minutes of questions on your talk. And then we have a sort of a general discussion on any broad area of topic. And please, please join because I think this is the discussion that makes these sessions so interesting. And as a reminder, we will be recording this and posting the talk on our YouTube channel. So thank you again, Jim, and please, please start sharing your screen. So thanks very much, Rishmi, for this very kind introduction. I have very fond memories of, of working on Stacy together with you all those years ago. It was a great time. Um, what, one small correction is that I, I was CTA project scientist only until 2019. I have to say that because Roberta is with us <laughs> and is project scientist now. Um, yeah, so I share my screen. Um, th thanks very much for giving me um, the opportunity to talk in this great uh, series. I, I was a bit uncertain exactly what, what, what I could say given um, there's already been a, a lot of great talks in the, in the series around the topic of, of PV particle accelerators in the galaxy. Um, but but I tried to fit in in with this. Uh, apologies, there's probably a bit of overlap, inevitably. But um, what what I'm going to do is just give a few slides of introduction on on what we're looking for um, in terms of PV particle accelerators in the galaxy, um, and then spend a block of time on on detection detectors and detection techniques and approaches, and then a very personal perspective on the on the observations in the in the last part of the talk but hopefully sufficient to provoke some some discussion um, I've got a lot of slides so I, I go I'll go quite fast but then uh, I understand there's plenty of time for discussion later okay so um deeply familiar to, to most of the people on on the uh, on the zoom probably is is the idea that with with strong interactions of um, of PEV protons and nuclei, we produce pions and, and other mesons, and in their decay, we have then uh, neutrino and gamma ray production. Um, the, if I take a monoenergetic beam of, of protons, the, the spectral energy distribution of the resulting gamma and neutrino emission looks something like this. Um, I have a peak in the SED, uh, something like an order of magnitude lower energy than the, the primary proton energy for gammas um, and a little bit lower um, for neutrinos. Of course, in, in real life, I don't have a pure proton beam or a pure proton target. 
um, and I and I have usually a power law uh, spectrum. Um, so this is what happens if you if you have a, a rigidity dependent uh, cutoff in, in a mixed composition. Actually, it doesn't make a huge difference accelerating particles to, to many many PEV because they have a higher charge doesn't help us much because in the end it's the energy per nucleon that, that dictates largely the gamma ray spectrum. So whatever we do, if we have PV as the sort of acceleration limit for protons, um, the gamma ray emission um, is, is peaking at significantly lower energies and with a spectral curvature that kicks in um, two orders of magnitude be below the, the, the um, maximum proton energy. So I, I say this basically to, um, to defend the fact that I talk here now, not just about observations at 100 TeV, but all the way down to one, one TeV, because really the, the measurement over the whole range is important. Um, and I, I will only talk about gamma ray observations today. I thought about having a few slides of neutrinos because this is obviously very important, but I, I think the organizers expected that I would focus on, on gammas. Just to say that um, neutrinos, of course, are potentially extremely powerful tool as well. Um, and the only reason they, they don't feel that feature heavily in my talk is at least for the moment, there's, there's a gap in sensitivity between neutrino and, and gamma ray detectors. Neutrino detectors typically don't um, provide sensitivities in, in, a, uh, in this kind of form. So it's a bit hard to compare, but they live somewhere up here. There is of course, um, enormous potential in the next few years. And, there, and there's these detectors really at the threshold of um, starting to really constrain the um, hadron acceleration in the galaxy. And I'm not just saying that because Francis has joined, but because this is really going to be an exciting time, I think, in the next few years. But I'm going to talk about uh, the gamma ray detectors. I won't start talking about them already here. Um, but this, this is all so far about hadrons, of course, the galaxy uh, contains many astrophysical objects that also accelerate electrons. Um, a little bit of background noise. Yeah, I'm just going to mute, ask people to mute, please, yeah. if you're not speaking. Yeah. So um, the, the classic example of, of a PEV electron accelerator is, is the Crab Nebula. And th this has been established for some time from the synchrotron emission um, and is now um, beautifully measured also in the inverse Compton um, emission from the crab up to a PEV with, with lasso. Um, and here, this, this is just a fit using synchrotron emission, inverse Compton emission, um, where you need a maximum energy of electrons of two PEV. Uh, and this um, I show partly to introduce the, the idea that we do in general expect rather steep high energy spectra for electron accelerators due to klein nasheena suppression um, of the inverse Compton cross-section. Um, there are some caveats to that that I'll come back to uh, later. Um, right, so what would I want uh, on my Pevatron uh, shopping list? Of course, you, you want to detect um, TV to PEV gamma ray emission from, from such um, objects. You really would like to characterize their spectral behavior um, and the shape of the spectrum contains a, a huge amount of information. Um, about the acceleration um, process and the radiation mechanisms, uh, transport, source evolution, many things are possibly encoded there. Um, I would like to resolve the, the emission um, and because once I've done that, I can really start to compare with, with other wave bands um, and particular to look for multi-wavelength counterparts um, and for target material which could be then the, the source of the uh, pound decay emission. Um, and in general, I expect to have energy dependent morphology, which is also a very powerful diagnostic. So um, usually the effects of cosmic ray transport and, and energy losses um, don't cancel and they're both energy dependent so that I expect some evolution of source morphology with energy. Uh, there are a couple of cases where they do cancel, for example, bone diffusion of electrons. But in general, uh, I expect such energy dependence to be there. And it can have either sign growing or shrinking with energy uh, and can really um, tell us a lot of physics. So a broad energy range, good resolution um, are important, as well as uh, 
just sensitivity, the highest energies. Okay, so that that's what I what I would like to have. And then the question then is, what can I get? What can we do as a community um, of gamma ray astronomers? And we do all of this TV plus astronomy from the ground using air showers. You can either detect the shower particles directly um, and use the arrival time of particles to get the, the shower direction, or you can use the flash of Cherenkov light produced by um, particles in the air, image this with telescopes and use the, the, the stereoscopic imaging to reconstruct uh, the properties of the primary gamma. So both of these are now very well established techniques. We have um, advantages and, and disadvantages of the two approaches. Um, the, the Cherenkov telescopes have higher precision in general, certainly at the, the same energy um, um, in the low energy domain, they can provide a lot more uh, precision in terms of angular resolution. They always have much better energy resolution because they're able to, to clearly map out the sort of development of the shower in the atmosphere. Um, they can provide large instantaneous collection area, but they have limited duty cycle because you, know, you can't run them during the day when the sun is up. Um, in contrast, the ground particle detectors have wide field of view, um, but more modest precision um, and more modest um, collection area instantaneously, but integrating over, over many uh, days um, with the 100% duty cycle, you can get very, very deep exposures. Um, so they're the two techniques. Uh, there are well-established um, successful observatories based on, on both. Um, and I start first with the, the ground particle-based detectors, which have come into their own a little bit more recently than the, the Cherenkov telescopes. Um, pioneering instruments included Milagro at Los Alamos, and the, uh, the Tibet Air Shower Array and, and Argo, various instruments over the years constructed uh, this high altitude site in, in Tibet. Um, detecting the first um, sources with this technique and, and Milagro did a nice um, survey of the, of the galaxy at sort of tens of TeV. And this is just showing you the, uh, the Cygnus region, interesting. Uh, region that I'm going to come back to, just to say that this is not, not new stuff, um, and there was this pioneering work done. What's happened since um, is a sort of new generation of detectors, Hawk and Lasso, and one planned uh, future detector that I'll say a little bit about, SWGO. And the main drivers of performance we have are the, the size of the instrument. Malagro had a, a, um, a very high fill factor, 100% essentially, but um, a, a size much smaller than the, the typical footprint of a shower, and that really limited its, its sensitivity. So we can build bigger detectors. We can, in general, increase the fill factor of detectors to collect more shower particles. And we can raise our instrument closer to shower max and get more particles at fixed energy by going to higher altitude. And this trend uh, has happened over the years from Milagro to Hawk to SWGO going to higher and higher altitude. Um, and increasing also the fill factor and size. And another critical point is the ability to, to get rid of the, the background cosmic rays, and that is based to a large extent um, on the presence of, of muons in large numbers and the um, hadronic showers, and this I'll come back to uh, a bit later on. Okay, a few, a few words about Hawk as an example. Uh, that, that I, I know reasonably well, which is um, an array of, of large water tanks, uh, these deep water tanks with, with photomultipliers in inside. There's 300 such tanks covering 20,000 square meters on the ground at, at pretty high altitude in, in Mexico. Um, and shower particles then produce Cherenkov light in the water, which is seen by the, by the um, PMTs. So this thing's been running now seven years. There was a, an, an outrigger upgrade surrounding detectors made in 2018, which I'll show very briefly uh, later. Um, and then if you have a detector like this, yeah, there's no moving parts. All you do is, is sit there and um, look up. And you see showers arriving from across the sky. And then you wait for the, the Earth to rotate. 
and, and via the rotation of the Earth, you, you map out the, the sky. But instantaneously, you already have access to a, a steradian or more um, of the overhead sky with good sensitivity. Um, and this, of course, is, a, is an advantage with respect to a Cherenkov telescope, where you have to decide where to point um, and pick a small um, part of the, of the sky. So for surveying large areas, that's clearly um, an advantage. Then you need to, to um, for galactic sources at least, typically we need to integrate for long, uh, long time periods over many, many transits of the source, and we need to do the, the best we can with background rejection. And in the end, you can make a, um, a gamma ray map. Um, this is, an, again, an example from Hawk, completely dominated by, by galactic emission. There's a couple of nearby uh, blazars here, but this is uh, essentially the, the galactic um, plane and galactic plane sources can change coordinate systems to make that uh, more clear as the galactic plane. Um, obvious now is, is a really big hole which I will come back to uh, later, which we need to fill. Um, and, and this was more or less where, where we stood um, a couple of years ago um, with, with Hawk as the, the primary wide field instrument working in the Northern Hemisphere. Then came uh, LASO. And the really exciting thing about LASO is the performance at the very highest energies. So there was this paper last year um, with um, 12 sources significant at energies above 100 TeV um, and with emission up to a PeV for the first time in gamma ray astronomy. So that's obviously very exciting. I'm going to talk a bit about these sources later, um, but firstly I wanted to say a few words about LASO. Um, it's really an amazing um, instrument. The, the effort of construction was, was phenomenal. It's really beautifully uh, done. The um, there are two components to it. There is a, um, a water Cherenkov detector, which is based on, on pools of, of water. Um, and this is a few times bigger than Hawk, um, the central detector of, of Hawk already. But most of the results that I want to talk about today come from what's called the square kilometer array, a, um, a sparse um, detector uh, with about 4% fill factor of uh, muon detectors, over a thousand of these very large buried um, underground um, water Cherenkov detectors. So each of these has got a single PMT um, and electromagnetic particles largely absorbed before they get down to this level uh, and it can be used to tag muons. On the surface, uh, 5,000 of, of these um, Mm -mm. scintillator detectors, which are these little green boxes that you see with, with smaller fill factor, detecting the, the electromagnetic part of the showers at high energies. So ju just to show you how, how well this works, this is, this is um, an example from the publication of, of LASO on the, on the uh, Crab Nebula. This is a 900 um, TeV event recorded in all of the subsystems of LASO. There's also a Cherenkov detector, which I skip over for, for time seen here in the, um, in the water, uh, one of the four final water pond detectors. Um, and here at that time, about a quarter of the, the square kilometer array was running. You see here the, um, the intensity measured in the, the scintillator detectors. And you can clearly see the core of the shower here. And these circles are um, hits in the muon detectors. And of course, at high energies in gamma ray showers, you do have a few muons. You also have sometimes penetrating particles that can make it to the tank. But if this were a proton, there would be hundreds, typically hundreds of these muon detector hits. So you can see that this is a muon poor, poor shower. And this is the base of the basis of the, uh, the hadron rejection. Just for sort of size comparison, this, this is um, Hawk and its outrigger upgrade in, in comparison. So you see that this, this is you know, dwarfed by Lasso, but, but still um, yeah, on a size which is significant um, in terms of collecting over the many years of Hawk operation, a nice exposure on, on high energy sources. Okay, so um, the, the basis is as I've said of, of the background rejection in, in the square kilometer array of Lasso is muon counting. And I just wanted to comment on, on how well it works. This is um, reconstructed energy on the, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the, the ratio of the, um, the muon number 
to the uh, the electron number. And so there's a sort of special category for no muons at all. Um, and you see gamma rays typically produce no, no muons until you get um, up to uh, PEV uh, energies. And then they always produce a few. Um, but you can make a cut in this parameter then that rejects um, what every um, every proton except for one in um, ten thousand or or less, and th this I, I then myself just to understand it compared to what you have if I if I simply you know I run Corsica showers and I and I count muons, and, and this is basically as as good as it could possibly be. Uh, there's there's um, having a bigger fill factor of muon detectors in Lasso, or or you know somehow better uh, muon counters wouldn't improve the. Um, the performance because it's already basically at the limit of, of what we have from from showers uh right so i want then to spend a few minutes talking about a project which is is dear to my heart i mentioned the hole in the sky in the in the southern um hemisphere we want to fill that using the southern wide field gamma ray observatory swgo constructed in the in the south um to to complement the northern hemisphere sensitivity of hawk and lasso this this shows you sort of uh, estimated sensitivity as a function of galactic longitude along the galactic plane with a peak at the galactic center for SWGO and complementing perfectly in the sensitivity then of, of Lasso in the north to get basically full sky uh, coverage. And of course, there's a lot going on in the, in the inner galaxy galactic center and the Fermi bubbles, which we want to target. And again, to, towards more of that uh, later. Um, so we're in a design and site search um, phase at the moment, defining the final properties of the detector and, and where to build it. We have excellent candidate sites um, in the Andes, still multiple um, possibilities in four countries, um, but hopefully next year we'll be in a position to, to decide we're shortlisting at the moment. Um, you may notice one of these is, is a lake, which is not the most uh, obvious solution, perhaps, um, but we are exploring three different options for the, um, the basic detector unit technology for SWGO, one of which is to put uh, the detector units directly into a natural lake um, or tanks in the Hawk, Hawk kind of style or, or a pond, something like Lasso. So this is all being investigated at the moment. We're, we're confident that at a high altitude site with a, with a large inner detector, this is kind of on the scale of, of the lasso in a detector, we can, we can do a, a very good job um, already at a few hundred GeV in terms of um, shower detection, characterization and background rejection. Um, in our reference design, we, we have units that look like this. They have two layers um, with the bottom layer intended to, to be used for muon counting. Yeah, which is, if you've seen this successfully exploited already in, in Lasso very well. All right, so we, we're on our way. We, um, we have some choices to make. We, we want to push towards a, um, an, an engineering array um, on site, which might be possible already in 2024, 2025. We had a boost recently with, with a po positive statements made in the, the, the decadal survey uh, that the US um, was encouraged, at least by Jordan and his colleagues, to, um, to invest 20 million uh, US dollars in SWGO, which would be about a third of the, the project cost. Of course, the money is not in the bank yet. We have a lot of work to do to secure the, the funding for SWGO, uh, but we're on our way. Um, I can't show you a sensitivity curve for the, for the detector because so far we haven't finished um, designing it, but we have a kind of target zone um, that you see here in, in orange, um, and we're going to um, push hard to, to do significantly better than Hawk and, and somewhere in the domain of what Lasso can do at high energies. All right, so I want to then go back to imaging Cherenkov telescopes. Um, the, the progression of course, I could give a whole talk about the sort of history and the evolution of imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes, but we've basically gone from single telescopes and, and coarse pixelation towards big arrays of finely pixelated um, cameras. Um, the current generation of telescopes, HESS, Magic and Veritas, I'll show results from uh, later on. Um, and the future is CTA. Just to note that, I mean, if, if I have a small array of telescopes, I'm limited by the size of the Cherenkov light pool. 
Um, and this basically limits my sensitivity at very high energies due to statistics, even if I can be background free um, to, to high fluxes around 10 to the minus 11 ergs. And there aren't sources that, that bright known in the sky. Yeah? So really, if I want to do significant astronomy beyond 100 TV, I need an array of detectors, which is much larger than the Cherenkov light pool, not like the, the current detectors. Um, if I go way beyond the light pool, I have to be aware of the fact that then I have large time gradients in my, my images, and I have large uh, offsets of the, um, the center of the image from the, the target gamma ray source. Um, and this, of course, needs to be considered in the design. So for CTA at high energies, we would use wide field of view uh, systems. I wanted to comment briefly on, on background rejection. Um, the, the traditional methods of gamma ray astronomy use the fact that the um, hadronic showers have got lots of subshowers. They look like a bit of a mess, as well as having lots of muons in them. Um, at higher and higher energies, the proton showers look uh, neater and neater, yeah, because there's this large number of superimposed showers, and they, they start to be uh, much more regular, uh, and the traditional approaches don't work as well. Um, but of course, they still have more and more and more muons. And one thing we looked into recently was um, using um, the Cherenkov light from, from muons as sort of directly um, as a veto mechanism for, for, um, for gamma ray astronomy. Um, this is a sort of extreme example, but you can sort of predict if you've got a large telescope that can see Cherenkov light from muons out to large distances, there should always be um, emission from those muons visible in the in the telescope. Here's an example where this, this is a, an event that would have passed the gamma hadron separation cuts if we only had the small telescopes, but you see in the big central telescope, a muon hit the hit the telescope and you have this nice ring. Yeah, so this doesn't happen very often, um, but even with a little arc, you can do a lot of background rejection. And this looks like a promising way of, of reaching large background rejection power at high energies. And um, we do that with this. Um, CTA prototype camera um, at the HESS site, and this is just a comment that there's also a sort of time domain signature separating the muons from the, the showers. Okay, um, so, ooh, sorry. So CTA, of course, is, is the, big, the big thing in, in our future. Um, we would have liked to have built it by now. There's been some challenges along the way, but I think we're now really on a good path. Um, we, we had... We plan still eventually to have a race that looked like this, but the funding is, is secure for a somewhat smaller number, like 40 um, SSTs, 14 medium-sized telescopes. But we'll still have more than square kilometer coverage um, on the ground in, uh, in Chile. Um, the, the, important, the most important telescope for the highest energy observations relevant for, for Pevatrons are the small size telescopes. The design there is based on, on years of prototyping work. Um, projects called Astri and Czech, and um, we have wide field cameras um, with, with sort of very long integration windows and sampling. So the, these very large impact distance showers that you see um, from measurements made in Sicily um, uh, are captured in, in space and in time, um, despite the, the large gradients and the, uh, the large offsets. So we're really, really excited about quite soon, yeah, in the next year or two, um, to be really begin in earnest construction of CTA South in, in Chile. And in the meantime, we, we will have um, these telescopes, similar telescopes operating in, in Tenerife in the so-called Minera. Okay, CTA will provide very wide energy coverage because of these combination of different telescopes. And this is just to show you how, if I have a kind of nominal Pevatron, okay, this is a bit of an extreme, um, spectral index I've chosen, but sort of reasonable uh, numbers for distance and energy injected target density. Uh, we should have really beautiful spectra for a CTA and be able to characterize very well the, the end of the spectrum and the, the maximum energy of the uh, accelerated particles, um, which we could compare to the kind of current situation um, with this example of supernova remnant RxJ 1713. It's, it's really a big step. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is angular resolution. So the, um, the big advantage at the moment of the Cherenkov telescopes um, at high energies is their ability to 
to resolve more precisely the, um, the direction of incoming gammas. And for, for CTA, this should be really an order of magnitude improvement with respect to Lasso at a few hundred um, TV in, in resolution down to a, an arc minute or so. There are things that can be done, of course, to improve the resolution also um, for the water Cherenkov detectors, and SWGO is, is aiming for something significantly better than the current WCDs, um, but we won't beat CTA, of course. Um, and, and this arc minute resolution at high energies is really possible only because we have very large multiplicity um, events. This is an example where you see 16 SST images all superimposed um, on top of each other, uh, which allows us to pinpoint the, the point of origin of the gamma ray really very, very precisely. Okay, so um, this, this was the part of my talk about um, the detector um, technologies, and I want to move on now to the part about um, observations. And this is, as I said before, it's a kind of personal selection, so apologies if I missed and your favorite um, source from the list, it's definitely not um, exhaustive. Um, and I wanted to start with the, the usual suspects, which are the, the supernova remnants. Just to say that in the, in the most dramatic cases, our, our brightest, most prominent um, supernova shells, we have an ambiguity between um, a, an electron and, and proton. Uh, radiating particle. Yeah, so we, we can fit the, the spectra with either um, proton or um, uh, PP emission by zero decay or with inverse Compton emission. Um, so this, this is, of course, um, unfortunate situation because we're, we, we feel a little, a little bit stuck. Of course, there are other things we can do. Um, but the most obvious thing is, is to look then for um, really target material being illuminated by cosmic rays, cosmic rays hitting something that we can map in some other wave band. Um, this we have, in, and there's a few nice examples of that, like this one from, from Veritas, where you see the, um, the gamma ray emission following um, nicely uh, the distribution of very dense uh, gas in, in this case. So it's just, this is a supernova rem remnant interacting with, with gas clouds um, so we know that this is accelerated protons. We also know it because you can you can follow the spectrum down to into the Fermi energy range and see that this this characteristic kinematic uh, cutoff um, in the pion decay spectrum. Um, but we're not doing much in terms of PEV acceleration in these systems. You see the spectra are quite steep and not extending to very high um, energies in these cases of usually fairly old um, interacting supernova remnants. So you, you could argue, well, if we want to find PEV particle accelerators, we have to look at much um, younger systems. And the, um, the younger, one of the youngest systems we, we have in, in the galaxy is, is Cas A. So this is a 300 year old um, supernova uh, explosion um, with a fast shock. Yeah, so should in principle be a good candidate for particle acceleration to very um, high energies. But as you see in this measurement from, from MAGIC, it doesn't. The, the spectrum turns over at, at very modest um, energies. So here we seem to be accelerating particles not, not beyond um, a few tens of TeV. Um, but still, I mean, th this can be still the wrong kind of supernova remnant. You know, maybe the, the fast wind of the progenitor means the density is too low and, and for B-field amplification. It could be many reasons. And no, no doubt Stefano will talk about that um, next time. But um, it could also be, of course, that supernova remnants are, are not the, the main contributor of cosmic rays at the, at the knee, as has long been thought. It yeah, can, be, can be something else um, entirely. Um, and of course, that in that regard, we were all very excited by these faces from from Lasso, um, revealing a large number of uh, of sources emitting at hundreds of of TeV. Um, and here, I just um, highlight a few of them: um, the the so called boomerang, a, a supernova remnant, um, plus pulsar in, in nebula. 
the uh, the Cygnus region, complex region. Um, this is the uh, um, Veritas survey of that region from a few years ago. Something called 1908, whether you like to call it Milagro 1908 or, or Hess 1908 or Hawk 1908, this is um, usually something 1908. Um, and I will say um, a couple of words about that in a minute, T together with its neighboring um, system, the microquasar SS433, which you see here at the bottom. Um, and this system of uh, two pulsar wind nebulae and, and a binary system uh, around HESJ1825, which is a bit at the edge uh, of the lasso um, sensitivity, um, but where there's, there's nice results from HESS and from, from Hawk. There's a bit of work to do sort of fully reconciling the, the two uh, wave bands, but this is a good track and I think will be very exciting. Um, once we've, we've finished doing that, it's nice um, complementary approach of combining the, the higher resolution, lower energy data of, of HESS with that of Hawk. All right, so um, the first one I want to talk about is the boomerang. Oh, no, I don't, sorry. First, I wanted to make a, a general statement that these sources have quite steep spectra, yeah, rel relatively steep spectra, uh, such that inverse Compton interpretations are still possible. Yeah, it's not unambiguously um, pi zero decay emission. Um, but there is a trick to that. You, you can't afford to have um, synchrotron dominated cooling in the sources um, and then feel the full, the full force of the klein nishina suppression at high energies. Um, you need to be in a regime where there's, there's a strong contribution to cooling from, from inverse Compton radiation in the klein nishina domain, which naturally hardens the, the spectrum um, and restores some of the high energy emission. So to do that, the natural way of do, doing that is to separate a bit the, the acceleration and, and cooling zones. Um, and that, that seems to be possible. Um, and there may be even observational hints of that as I get to in the next slide. And the other thing to say is mostly these high energy sources have nearby a young and powerful pulsar. Yeah, so the pulsar wind nebulae um, and nebula hypothesis is certainly plausible for, for many of them. Um, so now I want to say about the boomerang. So, so the boomerang is a very interesting um, object. There's some nice observations with magic presented at the last ICRC. Um, showing energy dependent morphology. The thing is really weird shape so that there is um, up, up here close to the pulsar in sort of within the, the supernova remnant, um, very strong measured magnetic fields and uh, very strong ordered fields. They look kind of toroidal. Um, so one could imagine that sort of particle escape um, from the system in that direction is basically impossible, but there might be a way to leak out to the south these two plots are in galactic coordinates. These two are in R8 X, sorry. So this, the orientation is different. Um, but in many wave bands, you see evidence for this kind of tail of emission or, or possibly es particles escaping out uh, uh, from the acceleration side into a low density and possibly low B field region um, down here. Yeah, and this uh, magic result taken together with the lasso result suggests that this is where most of the high energy particles are, are sitting rather than uh, close to the pulsar. And this wouldn't be shocking given what we, we understood so far about the evolution of pulsar wind nebulae, um, uh, as you see in this, this sketch from uh, Gunnell. It's a nice paper on that topic. Okay, so that's that's the boomerang. The, the next object is completely different. So th this is um, something called the Cygnus cocoon. Um, where around the Cygnus OB2 uh, star forming region, there is very extended diffuse emission seen, uh, firstly with Fermi and more recently with, with Hawk and Lasso is, is also um, measuring the, the region, um, where you see a sort of a nice continuous spectrum from GeV up to almost PeV, um, indicating the probable presence of, of um, very high energy cosmic rays, which could have been um, accelerated in, in supernova uh, in, the, in the system, or somehow by collective effect, effects of the, the cluster as a whole over millions of years and be, and be 
confined inside of some low density um, bubble and radiating uh, in gammas. So this, this is one of the three systems that prompted this nice uh, work by, by Felix and colleagues a few years back to suggest that the uh, massive stellar clusters in general uh, might be major sources of galactic uh, cosmic rays. I'm going to talk about all three of these of these systems. Um, so the main point here is there's a large amount of energy available, kinetic energy in, in winds, as well as supernova explosions that have happened in, in all these systems um, um, available for, for cosmic ray acceleration. I won't uh, mention why there are uh, I won't get into the theory because Stefan will do that next time and he's, he's better qualified to do that. Um, but just mention that there is this, this possibility. Now, I, I want now to switch hemispheres so I can talk about the other objects. And this is just to emphasize that this really is a, um, an asymmetric situation at the moment because I have in the north, Lasso and Hawk and Veritas and Magic. Um, and all of these results I've just shown you um, are possible. In the south, we just have Hess. So we have the, um, the survey um, of the galactic plane with Hess covering the, the inner part of the galaxy. And so I show you now basically Hess results. Um, but as I've already said, we really need a wide field instrument in the south uh, to complement um, Hess and CTA very soon. Yeah. All right, so the famous one, and this is this is a seven-year-old result, so I won't spend too much time on it, so as you no doubt already familiar with it, but the, the central molecular zone um, is, is lit up in TV gamma ray emission, um, and there is, wherever there is target material, there is, there is emission, the, the, the dense emission of the central molecular zone, you can, you can, you can track that in, in dozens of different um, wave bands in different ways. It's, these are very, very massive clouds. The distribution of material is, is pretty clear, even, even in three dimensions. Um, so we have really a great opportunity to trace um, the presence of cosmic rays, understanding where the target material is. So that's, that's a much better situation than we have uh, associated to massive stellar clusters, where it can be harder to understand exactly the distance um, and some of the uh, gas is maybe in a state uh, is, is warmer and harder to trace and so on. So this, this is a pretty good situation. Um, and what we found at the time was that the, there is a, a clear fall off of the cosmic ray um, density with distance from the center, which is con consistent with steady uh, continuous injection and diffusion of particles out uh, from a central source, which could be the massive stellar cluster right at the, the center of the galaxy, or could be the black hole. Um, or some, some other uh, object, but they're the two prime uh, culprits. And the emission from this region extends to very high energy, so suggests the acceleration of particles up to at least you know, half a PeV or so. Yeah, so this, this is really uh, kind of bulletproof, in, in my view, um, Hadron, uh, Pevatron. Um, um, but... We, we have interesting observations also of other objects, a bit newer. This, this is the latest Hess image of the massive stellar cluster um, Westerland 1, which is very small on this scale. This is marked by this black um, um, star. This is really a very big um, star forming uh, cluster. This thing was um, formed a few million years ago and it has about five times um, more massive stars in it than the Cygnus OB2 association. It's one of the biggest in the, in the galaxies, um, in the galaxy. And we see around it this big cloud of, of TEV emission. Of course, there can be multiple sources contributing, um, but it looks there's a kind of vaguely um, ring like structure of emission around the cluster. Uh, and it's very tempting to, to um, interpret that in terms of some collective process associated to the cluster or to the many supernova remnants that should have exploded in the, in the, in the last million years or so. Okay, so the, you can say, I, I was telling you energy dependent morphology is a great thing to look for, to, to sort of probe what's going on. And you saw this earlier in this nice magic result, but uh, here the, there isn't much going on and um, the statistics are not great as we go to high energies. But if I look at the sort of radial profile of this, it's quite stable with, with energy 
um, which sort of suggests it's perhaps some some physical thing that I'm seeing um, rather than just limited by by particle cooling or so on as we see in some um, some of the pulsar wind nebulae. So this this is intriguing. Um, Taken together with the, the Cygnus cocoon, um, it really suggests something important um, is going on associated with these massive stellar clusters. Um, the, the other natural thing to do is look for a correlation with, with target material or, or some correspondence, let's say. Yeah, we don't expect a, a perfect correlation because the, it's a convolution of the cosmic ray distribution. Um, but there's no real clear signature of some cloud, specific cloud being being lit up by, by cosmic rays from the cluster. And this could be because the, the illuminated material is sort of low, low density material inside the bubble, uh, the super bubble blown by the massive stellar cluster over the last few million years, or could of course um, still be inverse Compton emission. Okay, so um, my final object is, is not one on the, on the lasso list, um, it's it's rather faint compared to the others, but I think it's an extremely important um, object. Um, there's ongoing uh, work, um, so we'll know more about it in gamma rays in a, a year from now. This is why I write here, watch this space. Um, new results are in preparation. Um, but um, what we know is that there is emission from the sort of two um, jets of this system in, in a place where it, plausibly the, the, the jets from the, the central uh, system are being decelerated and there's some energy dissipation going on, um, which all seems very plausible. Um, there's also strong X-ray emission from those zones and this sort of the whole thing is consistent with inverse Compton emission um, in the gamma ray domain. But of course, this is not a pulsar wind nebula where I, uh, and I naturally have lots of electron positron pairs and I can accelerate just them and not necessarily any protons or nuclei. This is a, a heavy jet full of um, baryons as well as, as the electrons. And so it's essentially inevitable that, I, I, that we also have um, proton nuclei accelerated in the system as well, uh, up to at least as high energies. So this, this uh, for me, is, is a very strong candidate for a um, a, a PV uh, system, a, a hadron pevatron, despite the fact that we don't at the moment have really direct evidence for that. Um, also because it has this very fast um, shock, um, which is sort of sub, sub relativistic, but maybe a kind of very nice value for, for really efficient cosmic ray acceleration. Okay, so I, I draw slowly towards the end of my talk, I think approximately um, on time. The, the final thing I wanted to do was just draw on top of each other roughly. Sorry, I did this in PowerPoint, so it's not super precise, but the, the spectra of some of these sources and um, just thinking in, you know, in the, in the Lasso era, how, how do our um, Southern Hemisphere sources um, compare? What you see is, you know, the, the 1908 and the crab, they have these rather similar spectra actually in the end and they extend to extremely high energies because of the lasso measurements and um, the IACT measurements typically limited to much uh, smaller energy range here just for illustration I have the, the central um, source close to Sagittarius A star RxJ 1713 here you, in both cases you see a um, clear suppression at high fluxes uh, here is Westerland 1 that I was just talking about where the thing seems to continue at least a little bit further um, in the central molecular zone as well. But you see how great it would be to have lasso-like sensitivity also to be able to extend the spectra of Westerland 1 uh, in the central molecular zone. And of course, we'll have, we'll have CTA, and CTA will make fantastic um, measurements of these, of these objects in the sort of core energy domain, very, very precise. Uh, and will extend the, um, the spectra up to much higher energy than we can currently manage. And of course, with SWGO, we, we hope to reach a sort of lasso-like regime, um, also um, at really, really high energies for these sources. So 
the jury's still out at the moment, I think, on, on some of these uh, sources. We've, we've learned a lot, but there's uh, a huge amount that we can look forward to in the, in the years to come. All right, so I, I hope I was able to convince you that, that gamma ray uh, TV to PV measurements are, are a powerful tool. Um, I've not talked much about theory, but that, that you have to wait a, a week or two. Um, there has been obviously a very big step forward um, in the ultra high energy domain with the advent of, of LASSO. And of course, that's just the beginning. You know, the published results are for a fraction of the array um, and a small amount of time. So that, that will continue to, to grow as, as a fantastic data set. We do really need um, a Southern Hemisphere wide field um, uh, instrument and uh, a precise imaging Cherenkov uh, telescope. We need these Southern Hemisphere measurements. Um, CTA South, and particularly, particularly its SSTs, are really important for doing that. And we're excited about pushing ahead with those. We think, uh, I, I think we need also SWGO um, to have really sensitivity also for very, very extended um, structures um, and up to really, really high energies. And we're trying our best with Hess. So Hess is alone in the South at the moment and we, we don't want to turn it off and, uh, um, too soon. And there's a lot still that can be done um, in the data analysis. And I showed you, for example, this, this muon tagging at high energies has good potential to, to greatly reduce the, the background. And so hopefully there'll be a few more exciting results from Hess before the end. Okay, so, uh, and the final thing I wanted to stress is that, you know, it's, it's, it's critically important, of course, to have this ultra high energy um, sensitivity to detect um, pevatrons in the first place, but then to really understand what's going on, we, we need the wideband coverage and we need the, the excellent um, resolution and, and long-term as well, we, we need the, the combination with, with neutrino telescopes to really uh, be on top of the, the whole field of galactic pevatrons. I believe. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the excellent talk. I'm going to turn this over to Felix. Felix, are you going to start the discussion and maybe take questions? Um, okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Jim, for a great talk. Everything was quite clear, so I, I don't know there'll be question or not, <laughs> but I guess so because it's very, very hot topic and uh, we have very good prospects. So let's start with questions and then we'll go for some discussion. Um, so maybe just see that. Um, no, I don't see, uh, Reshmi, do see hands? I mean, just in this moment or? No, not, not yet. Not yet, okay, we should One start. Yeah. Hand. Marco. Marco, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody, hello. It's a pleasure to finally attend at least one <laughs> lecture of this series, uh, it's a very nice uh, occasion. I have a, a question for Jim. So you mentioned the Westerlund, uh, the HES data showing some sort of diffuse emission, especially at the energies uh, four, five TV, something like that. And then you said that it's not that different from what you might have observed also from uh, the Cygnus region. Can you say something a little bit more about that? Because this is quite interesting. Is this published, this uh, HES results? No, so the, the, these plots, sorry, I should have labeled that these plots were shown already at the ICRC um, last okay. year. We're working on a HES publication right now. I hope that will come out in the next months. So this is the um, complete, this is also the low energy, right? Yeah, so so the, I mean, of course, most of our statistics are at a few hundred GeV as, as usual. Um, yeah. The HES measurement though does extend, if I show you the spectrum, the, the HES spectrum extends to uh, with 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 some stats up to close to 100 TeV. So yeah. there is high energy emission there. The spectrum stays relatively hard. Um, there's emission over in, in a tens of parsec scale region. 
and it doesn't change dramatically with with energy. So this, this is quite a different situation um, to we have, for example, in SJ eighteen twenty five or so, where we, we see the thing yeah. shrinking towards a pulsar. So yeah. it, it's 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 really a different situation. It seems to be clearly associated to the massive stellar cluster itself, um, as we have with the Cygnus cocoon. So the, these two objects, I think, really are are, are a new class of, of object and very exciting. The, the central molecular zone, of course, this can also all be powered by the, the central uh, stellar cluster, um, yeah. but, but doesn't have to be. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe I ask a question and then I'll just sort of follow. Jim, uh, do you have some priority list for the CTA and for Southern Hemisphere for this kind of objects which can do, like CTA can do much better than HES or you need really, uh, I, I'm talking about the uh, Pevatron complex, not, not in general, of course, there's no doubt about yeah. that. And uh, uh, do you need, I mean, the, 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 what you said, and that, uh, that is true, most important probably for Pevatron's uh, small telescope array. And um, at the same time, WGO will be there. Uh, nevertheless, so both, both will happen. Uh, I mean, certainly has. Uh, do you think nevertheless, that will be good to have a, something like, kilometer array like in Lahaso, because um, probably, probably, uh, I mean, before I didn't ask this question because who knows what will be in the PV region, yeah. but now we see where so many sources. So do you think that it would be wise to work in that direction? Right, so that there were sort of two parts to that question. And, and maybe just to say first, I mean, in terms of kind of target priorities for CTA, uh, the first thing I would do is point all of the telescopes at the Galactic Center for a, for a long time and, and really understand that region before doing anything else. Um, and then the nice thing is the wide field of view of those systems. So, you know, you can, you can, you can do a lot in one, in one pointing already um, with, a, with a focus on a couple of regions in the galaxy. There could be a lot of great early science. Um, in terms of getting square kilometer coverage so we in SWGO we're still trying to work out what we can do in, in terms of uh, an outer low density array we had a really nice joint workshop with with lasso um, um, back in in January um, and I think there's a lot we can learn from lasso and I think also our colleagues in lasso are really interested also in in realizing something in the southern hemisphere on on a on a, a square kilometer scale so I'm really hopeful that we'll manage somehow something um, to get really high statistics also up to PV in the South. Yeah, and uh, what do you think about HES? Because you wrote very intriguing line, so HES is <laughs> So do you think HES still will uh, contribute? I mean, uh, HES certainly will contribute, but I mean, like breakthrough, could you I see? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Let, let's say, I mean, we'll always struggle for statistics at high energies in Hess, yeah, because we, we're not going to have suddenly square kilometer um, areas, but um, we can do better with background, I think. So when we talk about very extended objects, I think we, we may be able to improve the, the high energy sensitivity by getting rid of more, more background. But of course, for, you know, for point like sources, we, we just run out of statistics and, and that's, that's it. But th there's, there's a chance, I think, to, to do a bit better, yeah. Okay, David. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for this uh, this very nice talk. Uh, I actually have a question about the, the Galactic Center uh, diffusion mission. I think you were showing in slide 58, you were showing the different sources. Yeah, yeah. and for the diffusion mission in the, in the central uh, part of the galaxy, you, you show this power law extended up to almost 100, 100 TeV. But uh, even though it's not optimal, also with uh, northern um, instruments, one can observe the galactic center at large in its angle. And that has advantage. It has a disadvantage that you lose the low energies, but it has the advantage that you gain sensitivity at the highest energies. 
And, and some of the latest measurements with, uh, that were done with Magic that were published actually two years ago, they show a preference for a cutoff at around 20 TeV. So it might well happen that um, the emission, of course, you know, statistics is an issue. So we'll see how things develop in the future. But it might well happen that the diffusion emission in the galactic center doesn't extend uh, with a pure power law up to very high energy. It might well happen that it has a cutoff. Right. So, so I, I mean, so I showed the the Hess spectrum, and you see, you know, statistics above ten TV were very limited in in the in the Hess observation. So we have more data now. Apologies for not mentioning the the magic result, but you're you're right. We we can do um, collectively. We can do better. Um, with the current instruments than we we had in this 2015 publication, so we, we will know more before CTA. I, I agree, and indeed, um, some curvature, you know, always when we look deep, there's curvature of some kind in, in the spectra. So I would be almost shocked if this really carries on as a pure power law. But um, yeah, I, I'm also very interested to see how much we can do with with current data. Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe we start. Felix, I have a quick question. Yeah, sorry. It's sorry. about SS433, Jim. Um, I think you showed a little bit. Can you just summarize the current situation? So do we know, I guess there's some GEV emission from Fermilat that has been detected and very faint, right? Right, the, the GEV situation is 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 rather unclear. Actually, there's there's several different papers with with completely different conclusions. So I, I I wouldn't like to comment on that. But but there there is this clear detection in 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 Hawk at a few, which is mostly around ten to to 40, 50 TeV, where we see these these two emission zones, um, which are also bright in the in the X-ray, um, and both in Hawk and in Hess, there's work going on at the moment to sort of improve the um, experimental situation there. So as the problem that it's relatively faint, uh, it's a totally unique system. Um, and I think it's it's really one we have to, again, as a community do do justice to um, and understand what's, what's going on. And I, I, at least I can't see a way that you can avoid accelerating PEV protons there, but uh, maybe Stefano has other ideas. And then there's some correlation with X-rays there as well, right? Yeah, no, very, very clear that the these two zones are, are emitting also in, in synchrotron radiation in the in the X-ray. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marco, do you have a question or just uh, still your hand is? Uh, I don't have a question, but just that I see my favorite object there, SS433. <laughs> I cannot uh, be uh, silent. Uh, Jim, uh, you think uh, this is uh, the exhaust in some way of the jet, which is hitting some sort of uh, medium? You see that also in the radio emission map. So the radio, of course, is tracing the electrons. And the X-rays, if it is synchrotron, probably are the electrons as well. But we also know, as you say that in your slide, that uh, there are a lot of indications that these uh, jets are actually hadronic in some way. So they have, uh, a, I think they detected the iron line and therefore uh, I, we believe that there are lots of protons there. Right. So this is a mixture of uh, protons and electrons and the electrons are producing the radio and the X-rays. So do you know anything about the environment around those two TV spots? Uh... Okay, so I, I, I do my best to answer this question. So, so I mean, <laughs> the, if, if you want to, to connect the, the X-ray synchrotron and, the, and the, interpret the TV emission as inverse Compton, you need a magnetic field of around 10 microgauss, which doesn't seem outrageous, at least not. I think 16 mm. microgauss in the whole paper. Um, so, um, in, in, in every regard, it's, it's reasonable if the TV emission is, a, is inverse Compton of the same electrons that produce the, the X-ray um, synchrotron. Um, it seems as if then some energy is being tapped from, from the jet, so the jets should decelerate. And then, of course, the question is why? Yeah, what, what's stopping them? I'm not aware of measurements of, you know, really material there. Um, yeah. 
it's it's all, all of this is well within W50. Um, it's presumably um, what gas is there is rather hot and not not so easy to trace. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a bit difficult to to say something really about the the presence of of, of targets for PP interactions. So it could yeah. be that you accelerate protons, but they simply then make it out of the system and and, and interact on much yeah. larger scales. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Valentin, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jim, for this very nice talk. Um, I, I want to uh, comment about uh, precisely SS433 because, as far as I remember, at least uh, from a paper, I think it was Lee et al. 2019, it's about the GV. I know that you prefer not to talk about that because it's quite messy. Mm. But um, I, I remember that there are observations. Uh, which indicate the presence of dense material, at least in the line of sight, towards, uh, uh, as far as I remember, at least uh, towards one of the sides of this uh, structure. Like, uh, actually, this paper showed that the emission may be off axis, let's say, with respect to the symmetry axis of the jets. And there were, there were indications of molecular clouds inside, or at least in the background or foreground of the, of the supernova. Uh, shell, whatever, how to call it. And uh, well, maybe the idea is that indeed something got en engulfed inside. I mean, in principle, it could be possible. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And and I think, um, I mean, there was also some evidence of um, per periodicity in the GEV, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, and, precision and, one. Right. And, you know, so th which would be, you know, it's hard, of course, on such large scales, but um, so it would be would be really great to sort of get to the bottom of the GEV and, and understand what's going on there. But but the idea that, that there's some um, emission associated with escaping protons is is very plausible. Mm, yep, yep. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, may I continue since we have started discussion about SS four hundred and forty-three? So uh, Lahaso has a very good sensitivity. But even for Lahaso, source is very weak. That is one so weak that even Lahaso need some time. But clearly, in one two years, and I mean not only uh, WCD8 Cherenkov, uh, what Cherenkov, but also Kim to a should be able to contribute here. Uh, but still, still, um, angular resolution will be key factor. So it would be very important also for Cherenkov telescopes. To 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 uh, the, the, I think the game will be impossible with Cherenkov telescopes at the end. Of course, the Pevatron is true that Lhaso can do a lot, but still we need a morphology, and the morphology in the very high energy part, above tens of TV, at least ten TV. So in that context, um, I think it will be very important for. Uh, Lahaso, oh, okay, Hess is doing well. I, 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 I understand we cannot tell much about Hess, but it certainly Hess has a good sensitivity and could come very good outcome, as well as Veritas in, in, at Magic. So source is very nicely located. On the other hand, I, I, I think we need still better sensitivity than Hess for this object in multi, hundred, multi ten, tens of TV region. So one could be uh, in, the, in the next few years, here maybe Astri could contribute a lot because Astri will be located. So that was my, my question. I just wanted to discuss as a, as a discussion. So it's, um, you mentioned that and uh, it abs I absolutely agree that Cherenkov telescope are number one partners for this Pevatron, Lahaso, Hawk type detectors. And uh, not all of them, but which work in the highest energy part. And in that case, small telescope array is CTA, but also hopefully we'll have, I don't know how soon, but in, in coming years, Astri. So the Astri could be excellent. Um, for Astri, this could be excellent object together with Lahaso. Just, uh, uh, absolutely, Felix. And I, th I think this, I mean, it, it would be, 
will be crazy almost for um, with the Astrium and array not not to take a deep um, observation of this region because I mean there's there's this 1908 object and next to it SS433. So this is part of the challenge for Lasso is you know that there's really an overlap here of these two sources, yeah, but exactly. um, but it's a and great one is very strong and one is very weak. Yeah, that is that is point. And uh, so coming about, uh, just lost my comment and. Uh, uh, just uh, everyone is mentioning Austria as a mid, mini array. I think is a great underestimate of Austria. I mean, at least in not for this in this context. And since Lahasa is operating, we need something a bit more sensitive factor to work free than than has very task magic, and most likely this will be Austria. So that will be. I mean, I personally would build Austria only just for this source because it's so weak and we don't need that anyway so this very personal view oh, it's 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 only mini compared to cta i think right it's otherwise it's a pretty <laughs> nice it's really nice nine and the threshold does matter i mean in, in this specific case okay so other comments should i stop sharing now felix and um, yeah, maybe maybe you could if you some. Um, yeah. So uh, Jim, maybe you could say a bit more about uh, this um, South Observatory SWGO a bit because you mentioned, but that is very interesting. I mean, in the context of this talk, because I guess you have different options. You mentioned Lake, but also maybe you have could a bit comment more about having came to a type. And what will be the price? Uh, just not without any political issues. I mean, or funding. Just do you think in this er in this in this direction? Yeah. So, so that, I mean, this is intensive discussion inside the collaboration right now, no? Because um, so we 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 have a, a, um, a reasonably clear concept of, of a central, very high fill factor detector. No? We we think that this can be useful up to pretty high energies because if you if you think about having a, a large amount of muon collection area even for showers that land well outside you know you can still make use of that central facility to do a lot but we definitely want to have a low fill factor outer detector so the question then is you know um how big how low fill factor and and with what technology and um at the moment we studied water cherenkov detectors still for this outer detector um, in Lasso, these are, um, are, are scintillators, but I, th I think um, one reason not, not to do water drink off for Lasso, I think, was just, you know, they would freeze at, at that site. Um, so the, this, we, we want to have, we, we have ideas actually for two joint task group forces with Lasso. One of them is about optimization for, a, for an outer low, lower full factor detector um to to just look at the kind of price performance trade-offs of different approaches with buried muon detectors versus water tanks and, and so on um and the other one is is um also colleagues in lasso are quite interested in the lake possibility and they've started to do some tests on lakes close to lasso and so we're talking about that um together as well so i think um yeah i can't i can't say too much firmly <laughs> Because in the end, of course, if we have a fixed budget, it's going to be a trade-off between the performance at low and high energies. Um, and people in the collaboration um, have different focus. Of course, we'd love to do everything. Um, and I think it's clear we, we want to have some capability at you know, 100 GV, let's say, or a couple of 100 GV, and some capability at PEV. But the balance is something we're going to work on over the next year or so. Yeah, thanks. So please, some comments, questions. Uh, just a quick question on the timeline. What do you think uh, is, I mean, I know you said that it's got slowed a little and, you know, with, with the pandemic and everything. Next year, you think you might have a decision on the site and you think, or, and then there's the construction, which will be several years, right? Right. Yeah, so you know, it's it's many many years before we we have uh, the kind of sensitivity curves that I've been showing you. Now. And um, yeah, we we managed one in person meeting as a collaboration before the pandemic started. So 
you know, we, we've got used to seeing each other by Zoom, but of course we've we've been slowed down and, and the whole site characterization is is tough um, during a pandemic. So we're, we're trying to ramp up now and um, we're going to have site visits this year. Um, and yeah, it, we, we really hope next year we can we can pick. Um, and then we have the idea of of a, of a small scale um, yeah, pathfinder, if you like, um, or an engineering array, as we, we call it. Um, to get going even before we've secured the full the full finance for the whole thing, you know, sort of build up confidence and credibility. And, and already, if we can manage something, the kind of 10% scale of the final instrument, it will already have hawk-like sensitivity. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, that's something really interesting um, and really new. So I think um, it'll be a long, long time before we have, you know, the full SWGO that we, we envisage now running in the south but maybe we can get something more modest um, on a shorter time scale uh, jim do you think you have a, a too low threshold uh, of swgo to like 100 gv or so because that is mainly not topic of this talk but that could be one of the greatest things i mean to monitor transient sky um, yeah, so so one one of our our target science targets is prompt prompt emission from GRBs. So I mean, the nice thing about the instantaneous large field of view um, is we can really see yeah, t, t zero for for GRBs, and we we want to get to the sensitivity level that we you know we can push out to to a large enough redshift that we'll we'll have statistics. So our current predictions. Um, are at the sort of level of GRB a, a year or so. Uh, of course, they might be optimistic. They might also be pessimistic. You never know. But I mean, the, the nice thing is the TV emission of GRBs is now well established with the recent Magic and Hess results. Um, and so we 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 know at least in the in the in the afterglow um, what to expect. So we can start to make more confident predictions. And that's really one one of the targets that we have. Yeah. yeah. But uh, may I not agree with this um, pessimistic view about, or I mean, it's over pessimistic one because never you know what GRBs will bring. I mean, if it's related to the uh, Fermilab detections, I mean, it it could be, I mean, pure, not theoretically, I'm speculatively, I mean, just could be even come 100 GV GRB. I mean, that uh, that is, a lot of unpredictable things are here. And yeah. especially it's extremely exciting because it has relation to Grute, I mean, the neutron star mergers. And that is a, such a great science. So yeah. everything just too based on the observations by, by Fermi, it would be quite, I mean, imagine you, uh, you have some security uh, 10 times better than, it could be better than Fermi. And how you could rely on Fermi? So Fermi maybe missed all GRB events below yeah. its sensitivity. It's very small. And then uh, you have a peak at let's say 100 GV, and that sensitivity is sufficient. So, to uh, I'm just speculating. I'm just, but I'd say it, it could be possible. We could not exclude. Uh, just to, something could happen. Because Fermi is a very, very uh, limited sensitivity, one square meter. Yeah. And uh, it's not necessarily peak should be me exactly at, at, at the GV energies. Peak could be 100 GV, still is, still is good not to be absorbed, still is good to have a significant part of the sky, uh, the universe, sorry. And in that sense, uh, it is, a, in my feeling, it is a common opinion that, I mean, relating to G you see what happened with the afterglows that that is the case yeah. now are more but in fact it's even more exciting than afterglow i mean the main events even maybe before that who knows what what is there so i think it's the it's the case we should target to this low threshold maybe sensitivity is not the biggest issue it, you have square 10 hundred square meters but the threshold maybe just to really target to go 100 GV, because if, if you have a cutoff at 100 GV, then who cares what is your sensitivity at one TV? 
So that that I think it's to some yeah. extent, not, not for afterglows, I mean, some new phenomena. So that could be, um, I think is important issue to push with is WGO. I mean, as a, not only GRBs, as AGN, just uh, monitoring the sky. So that 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 could be uh, what 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 comes to the transients. Then sensitivity, of course, is important, but not just showing sensitivity compared to other instruments is is new and is a full is is a really beautiful. So so in in other words, to get uh, ten times or more sensitive than 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 than. Fermi at 100 GV could be a lot of unexpected discoveries. Mm. Or so maybe because all other things with uh, is WGO, it's more or less hoax science with much better sensitivity. Of course, it will bring it will bring great science, but more or less we know what science. I mean, yeah. uh, but this the GRB this transient still could be something extremely important. I mean the, the the I mean the the elements that we have yeah on beyond CTA let's say yeah beyond what you can do with CTA anyway I mean we have you know, very very large scale diffuse emission yeah Fermi bubbles galactic diffuse emission um, we have the very highest energies and we have this transients and and this this is what we can add and and I think there's exciting possibilities in all of them. Okay, so so people are silent. That that I, I predicted. I said it was very clear talk. So should not expect. Can I say something? Uh, can I say something, Felix? Yes. Uh, so I uh, really would like to praise uh, Jim's efforts because really Jim has been a driving force behind uh, uh, this crazy name. Uh, yeah, it's WGO. So the only little problem of this at the moment is the name, which is almost uh, difficult to pronounce. That. <laughs> so Jim, not happy with the complications of CTA, now embarked uh, in this very difficult enterprise. Of course, uh, uh, having seen the funding of CTA in recent uh, couple of years, uh, Jim knows very well that we have to really secure the funding of, of CTA, and for that is uh, absolutely priority number one, because we, so, some way, stretched a little bit of the parameters of the funding agencies in our countries already. Yeah. But then the preparation for this beautiful experiment in the South, I think, uh, has to continue uh, with all uh, testing and all uh, also uh, trying different ideas in different uh, contexts. Uh, Felix is mentioned in the low energy. Uh, of course, it could be also the PV energy uh, range, but the low energy, of course, is extremely rich. And the gym knows that within the collaboration, SWG collaboration, there are different ideas, different ways. We hope in, in the next couple of years to really test some of these ideas at the four or 5,000 meters uh, with new technologies and see whether we can really try to conquer the 100 GB range, because I think that would be really fantastic from the astrophysics point of view. So, so maybe at some point you will give us again another talk about all this and uh, with some testing done, and that would be really fantastic. And then, and then we will find the money. Then we will find the money. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Galileo, Galileo promised you, Marco, right? Since yes, <laughs> Galileo is behind. So <laughs> exactly. So Galileo okay. will find the. I, I'm, I'm glad that this this is being recorded, Marco, because you know if if the enough president offers me the, <laughs> the money, then <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much for your your two kind. Well, we'll try. And, we'll try. And your support. And this is very very much appreciated, and uh, yeah, we try our best. So, Reshmi, maybe we should conclude. Yes, I think, yes, I think we are almost out of time. I think this was great. Jim, thank you for an excellent talk. It was very clear. And uh, I just want to um, invite people back in two weeks. We have the talk by Stefano Dabici, who's going to address the theory and phenomenology. And then um, moving on, we will continue through the, through, um, I think we'll continue the series, Felix, until 
mid June, I think we projecting and then suspend for the summer again. Um, starting in April, uh, we will focus on active galaxies and jets and blazars. And we already have a, an excellent set of talks which will be updated on the website. So thank you all for joining and feel free to write to us with any suggestions, any comments uh, to Felix, to Paolo, to Yuri Levin and myself. And uh, have a good day and good evening to some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.